uh, on, on behalf of uh, the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy, where I'm the uh, uh, senior researcher, I'm Christy van der Westeisen, and also uh, the Faculty of Law. I'm very happy to see our um, uh, acting uh, DVC Research Innovation Internationalization here, who was uh, very involved in arranging this event last year as Dean of Law. Professor Avinash Govanji, and then Professor Joanna Burta. Very good to have you here today as well. And um, the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education and Transformation, Professor Andra Kiet, who uh, is also another one of our co-organizers of this event. So very, very happy that, that the three of, of uh, these three entities could come together to bring uh, Professor von Marle out. So um, I think everybody has seen the uh, invitation, but I will just refresh your memories. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Professor Karen von Marley, who's, who's here from the Free State. And I must tell you, I was just mentioning earlier that to escape from Bloemfontein nowadays via plane is quite a story. You, you may find yourself uh, stranded at that airport for several hours. So, uh, so we really appreciate that uh, Professor von Marley undertook this journey because it is via Johannesburg. One can't fly directly to Port Elizabeth. And um, Professor van Marle is uh, at the University of the Free State, where she teaches legal philosophy and legal interpretation in the Department of Public Law. And I know her actually from the University of Pretoria, where she spent uh, the previous 20 years uh, also teaching legal philosophy in the Department of Jurisprudence, where she was also HOD for a very long time. And her research falls within the broad field of law and the humanities. It involves critical theory, legal philosophy, and jurisprudence. Her work on post-1994 jurisprudence engages with the crisis of modernity and the rethinking of law and legal theory along the lines of fragility, finitude, and the giving up of certitudes. She is an ethical feminist, that's how she describes herself, so we and, and her research and writing are inspired by and embedded in feminist theory. So as you just can hear from this very, very brief, she's, a, she's, a, um, she's widely published, uh, very uh, um, highly regarded in her field, and I would say one of, one of the more uh, influential legal philosophers in South Africa in terms of her contribution over the past uh, 20 plus years. So we're very, very lucky to have her here today. I'm very excited to hear her presentation. After that, uh, we will have a uh, Q&A session, which will be moderated by Mr. Gary Richards, who's with the Faculty of Law. And I'm looking forward to a lively discussion today. We've got, uh, this will be videoed as well. And uh, we will be posting this to, uh, to YouTube a bit later on, courtesy of Krishet. Thanks, Krishet. Krishet is also to be thanked for the lovely snacks that you are enjoying at the moment. So, without much ado, let me hand over to Professor van Marle. And she has about 45 minutes after which we will engage in the, the Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so let me just also start by thanking um, Christy and also Andre Kiet. We, we started with email correspondence already last year, and I'm very happy to be here. And also all the colleagues in the, in the Faculty of, of Law, um, for, uh, and, and, and really Zandile for all your arrangements with flights and accommodation, transport, um, Gary for hanging out <laughs> with me today um, up till now. Um, but really more seriously, I think universities are all and faculties are going through difficult times. And it's really only these kinds of opportunities, debates, discussions that will pull us through. So I think thank you very much for, for academic community and, and for intellectual friendship and that we can keep on. Um, building and, 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 and strengthening it. All right, so I, what I want to do today is I want, to, want us to consider the idea of the Constitution as a living document and that, what that might entail. And we're going to go through some theoretical discussions that will 
work with this notion of augmentation or continuous change or continuous transformation. And at the heart of this, really, the notion of resistibility or the possibility of resistibility. So my immediate context or concern is that so many grand claims are being made about the Constitution, also the South African Constitution, constitutionalism as such, and I'm concerned about the extent to which these claims prevent us from engaging with the Constitution, with the notion of constitutionalism um, in a nuanced way. Um, I think it's much more complex than some of the broad strokes that, we, that are being made. Um, so you'll have to indulge me because somewhere in the paper I'm going to refer to some of the work that I've been doing on spatial theory and specifically the idea of inhabitants. Because I think, and you can also help me as audience, but I think there's something in this idea of inhabitants as it was developed by Henri Lefebvre, a, a French spatial theorist, that can help us to make sense of the constitution as a living, a living constitution. Um, Towards the end, I'm going to um, refer or show a few slides um, from William Kentridge's recent exhibition. I've been engaging with Kentridge for a while, specifically how he writes about his techniques of drawing, um, but also his critical and continuous critical engagement with notions of modernity and Western modernity. I find inspiration. So therefore, then the title of my talk, which is really a project that I want to work on at the moment towards a jurisprudence of doubt, and I want to sh ask together with Kentridge, why do I hesitate? Okay, so let me start by recalling four positions on constitutionalism that have been described recently. So firstly, uh, let's call it a conservative position, which insists that the Constitution should protect existing rights, affirm the status quo, and really believes that all references to transformation is an ideology. Secondly, a second group, uh, we can call them the constitutional optimists, that believe um, the Constitution, in a way, has solved our problems constitutional project as success. Thirdly, I'll call a critical position that since the early 1990s cautioned against an over-optimistic or over-romanticized vision of the Constitution, but that has nevertheless not rejected the idea of constitutionalism and has continued to push for radical change by reinterpreting the law, constitution, and jurisprudence. And fourthly, the position that argues for the Constitution to be abolished, for a delinking from the Constitution, holding that the Constitution not only furthers past legacies, but as such manifests much, if not all, of the fraught past. Now, I've always found myself and still find myself situated in the third position described above. I do not understand and I have not been persuaded and thus do not agree with the in attempt to collapse positions two and three, in other words, the Western liberal optimist one and the critical one, by coupling them together under an um, umbrella of liberal consensus, Western allegiance, whatever. But similarly, I do not think that position three and four, the critical position and the delinking position, could be seen as the same. My concern is that the third position, what I regard as an important, albeit minor critique, will disappear, that the few who have been part of this position will side, either with the second or the fourth position. So I want to argue for a critical jurisprudence that responds to the many complexities that South, Africa, South African society faces, but with nuance, not broad strokes and generalizations, and also care, neither aggressive nor defensive, and with thought, not strategic or calculated. So I'm of the view that the third position has an important place, also in legal scholarship, legal education, most pertinently in the LB curriculum, but I think also at public discourses and debates like the one we're having today. So 
I've previously contemplated post-1994 jurisprudence by looking at the lives of Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela. Um, and and I, I recently revisited my previous reflection and, and, and attempted to complicate that view. So a central theme in my initial take was the idea of the coming of age novel, The Buildings Roman, that in a way matches Nelson's life, but not Winnie's. So I revisit and question some of the stark lines or divisions drawn in my previous piece, and in doing that, underscore the need for complexity. Drawing on work published after the death of Winnie Mandela, I argue that Nelson might have been treated too simplistically, too simplistically paired with that sec second optimist position, um, and maybe Winnie not with enough attention to her role in past violence. Her life manifested one of resistance against the manifold oppressions of colonialism and apartheid, but at the same time it is more complex. And it's this complexity that for me is significant when holding this third or critical position. I draw on Duzinas and Geary's invocation of an aesthetics of life in their call for a return to a general jurisprudence. I repeat my allegiance to a general jurisprudence and not a restricted one. The former embracing the notion that jurisprudence includes and should include the aesthetic, ethical, and material aspects of legality. The latter then restricted reducing law to rules and legal education to professional training. The crux of my previous contemplation was to side Nelson's story with a certain modernity and cosmopolitanism to read his life according to the traditional buildings roman as one of transformation and growth. And the jurisprudence associated with the story is one that treats history in a linear fashion, one that is maybe symbolized by Etienne Mureinik's notion of the Constitution as a bridge that will bring us from a bad past to a better future. In this version, one might say that we have left the past behind and have transformed almost fully to a democratic society. Um, and of course, we question this one. And I, I describe the story as underpinned by a modern idea of progress and an optimistic embrace of the Constitution and human rights. And, and we, we know that William Kentridge, as an artist, engaged critically with this notion also. But tentatively, and it's tentatively because my argument in this piece rests on complexity and care, and I want not to draw stark divisions and, 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 and categories, Let's say this version of Nelson's life can be coupled with the second position described above. And my reading of Winnie's in the previous piece is a, is a person whose life thought at the linear path of a building's roman, someone who fitted comfortably neither in a certain modernity nor in the law. Her position was one of marginalization, representing excess, that which cannot be still or contained by modern legal order. So maybe if Nelson's life then reflected the second one, Winnie's reflected the third. But I think in rereading and rethinking their stories and also taking account of the complexities and nuances of their lives, um, the difficulty of easy pairings come to the fore. And this might even ask us to reconsider even these four positions that I set out. Um, in the beginning, or at least it will prompt us to redraw the lines between these positions constantly. So I draw here, or at least it's in the background of this, um, on previous work done on unlearning, but specifically unlearning within the context of land appropriation as constitutive of normal. So it was a project on the work of Carl Schmidt and, 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 and his work on normals. But I link this also with epistemic violence and related to epistemic violence language. And I, I want to, I, in this work, I ask to what extent is the right to land or ownership and property linked to a certain system of knowledge and with that then the imposition of a certain language? How does language relate to the idea of normos, law, as fundamental or constitutive? So central to Spivak, because she's one of the first person talking about unlearning, is the unlearning of privilege that includes also the unlearning of certain knowledge that should result in the giving up of power and privilege relating to the knowledge itself, but also the language in which theories, concepts, and methods manifest themselves. 
So what must be unlearned relates to the occurrence of the epistemic, linguistic, and territorial violence that accompanied conquest. And I've been working on the idea that spatiality then as a relation is bounded to epistemology and language. That to think about spatial justice involves thinking about epistemic justice and language, and for my talk today, also constitutionalism and jurisprudence. So, so how can we bring unlearning to the Constitution? And can the Constitution, how do we unlearn the Constitution? Or can the Constitution actually be a project that, that uh, helps us to unlearn? So we talk about transformation and the extent to which the Constitution could bring about transformation. So can the Constitution also bring about a certain unlearning? So maybe this to talk about the connection between language and land and the extent to which visual art and literature um, uh, responded to this. For example, the traditional farm novel filled many libraries over the years, but the subversion of this genre has become more prominent. And previously, I've reflected on writings by J.M. Kutsia and Anki Kroch um, as attempts to respond to what Kutsia aptly calls the failure of love in South Africa. And today, I, I, I turn then also to some of the work of, of William Kentridge and consider whether through unlearning alternative knowledge is language, other approaches to language, and ultimately also other approaches to land and property could be disclosed. For example, also by engaging Walter Mignolo's notion of border, border thinking. Um, and, and, and I'm thinking here of Mignolo's reframing of the Cartesian notion of I think, therefore I am, to I am where I think, or he also says, I am where I do and think. So you can see the shift from I think, therefore I am, to I am where I think, I am where I do. And, and think. Okay, so let me refer a little bit to some of the, the spatial theory and why, because I'm, I'm heading towards thinking about the living constitution, the constitution as a living document, linking it with unlearning, and here now also linking it with inhabitants. So maybe importantly, the distinction between habitat and inhabitants. Um, so, 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 so habitat then, really referring to a functionalist approach to housing provision, whereas inhabitants encompasses so much more. So over and above the actual structure, it opens possibilities for how one lives, for political engagement, and also affect. So this distinction is helpful for me in exploring and thinking about spatial justice and how spatial justice links with epistemic justice, but also with language. Um, but here yeah, I'm also interested in thinking how this could help us in, in, in our engagement with the constitution. Can we think of a constitution, and I'm not saying this is the South African constitution, but a constitution that does not merely provide for structural arrangements, habitat, but, but that can allow for active participation, including, because you might say, of course, the constitution is already doing this, but here including resistibility. Um, and what could it mean to read inhabitants then also with cohabitants? Cohabitants, really, um, Hannah Arendt's notion of sharing the world with others. Um, and related to this, the question of belonging. So important for my reflection is how epistemology and language affect inhabitants, cohabitants, and belonging. And to what extent can any, but maybe also for our purposes, the South African constitution make living together and also belonging possible? And we might say it can't, but I'm trying to say it's too easy and we need to push. So I want to refer quickly to a, to a case on street names because for me this case um, really illustrates these links between spatial justice, epistemic justice, and language. So after the institutional dismantling of apartheid, the constitutive relationship between nomos and naming played out in a very concrete way um, in a case on the naming of streets in the city of Tuane Pretoria, where I used to, to live and where I spent many years of my life. 
a right-wing organization, Afri Forum, challenged the City Council of Pretoria's decision to change the names of a number of streets. In the majority judgment delivered by Chief Justice Mokhweng, the Constitutional Court allowed the city to proceed with changing the names. And he started his judgment by recalling South Africa's historical past as reflected in the preamble of the Constitution. And the gist of his narrative is how apartheid is a system of institutionalized oppression based on an irrational differentiation between black and white that depicted black people as intellectually inferior and lesser beings resulted in a situation where there was hardly any city, town, street, or institution named after black people's historical leaders. Virtually all recognition and honor was given to white people and their history. So in this regard, Mekhoeng remarked, and now this is in 2016, South Africa still looks very much like Europe, away from Europe. And interesting, Afri Forum's main argument ironically rested on the contention that their sense of belonging was being infringed by the removal of the old street name signs. Now, the case also raised a number of technical issues, but for my purposes, I want to reflect on the notion of belonging and how the Chief Justice rightly challenged Afri Forum's reliance on belonging by invoking the sense of belonging of black South Africans living in Tswane, Pretoria. So the majority judgment speaks to how epistemic violence coincided with spatial justice. Black people in Pretoria were not only forcibly removed, evicted from their houses and given space only on the outskirts of the city, but their history, their memories, their humanity were simultaneously denied. So in Lefebvre's term, they were not only denied habitat, but also inhabitants. Now the minority judgment delivered by Justices Fruenemann and Cameron raises a number of complexities. And I'm not going to go into their judgment today, but I do think that their judgment beckons deeper thinking about what Arendt calls wanting to share the earth, that Butler interprets as cohabitants, but also what Spivak is to, uh, saying about um, ethics. So, so there's something in their minority judgment, together with the majority judgment, that I think calls for uh, a nuanced perspective, a critical thinking, and a, and a critical jurisprudence. But the case demonstrates for me something of what inhabitants entails. Lefebvre lamented the shift from inhabitants to habitat, which to him was central to modernism, and in particular a branch of technological modernism. Habitat then focused only on economic and technical questions of housing provision. In the context of Pretoria or Tswane, one could argue that with the formal end of apartheid and with legislation like the Notorious Group Areas Act repealed, habitat was possible to all who live in the city. Although given the vast homelessness in the city, that claim would probably also be merely theoretical. But inhabitants, captures far more and is focused on active and meaningful participation in social life. Inhabitants invokes the struggle for home and for belonging as manifested in the street name issue. It speaks to epistemology, what we know and then the struggle to unlearn. So the question that comes to the fore then is, if, is whether inhabitants extends to all who live not only in a city but in a, in a country, and how do we respond to a colonial apartheid racist past in a way that discloses new ways of in engagement and not mere repetitions? This question is related also to the notion of unlearning and in light of Schmidt's insight on naming to unnaming. When we conf confront epistemic violence that occurred with conquest, the need for inhabitants as an insistence, not on mere habitat, comes to the fore. And in a way, this goes hand in hand with the call for Western knowledge to be challenged, to be decentralized, for Europe to be provincialized, um, and for both understandings of unlearning, as explained by Spiva, to occur. So maybe Mignolo then unpacks the inevitable relationship between colonialism and modernity. And this is important for my argument because he exposes the complicity then also between land appropriation and the appropriation of ideas, history, and knowledge. He explains how the modern or the colonial world is a product of very specific histories. Um, and maybe then importantly, he, he, his call for a border thinking 
um, which he then ties to, to the border, to the, which ties the border to epistemology. So with reference to Spivak, then also Mignola discusses the extent to which the subaltern can't speak for herself. And he says, yes, it's because of the pervasiveness of Western macro narratives. Um, argues that not only did both neoliberal and neo-Marxist macro narratives come to the fore at the height of the building of the nation state in Europe, but these nation states were at the same time also involved in the second wave of colonial expansion. The underlining point here is that the expansion of capitalism happened simultaneously with the expansion of concepts, methods, and theories. Mignola refers to a hegemonic right discourse and asks, shall the world continue, this is quoting Mignola, shall the world continue to think and speak from the hegemonic models of thinking, from the, rights and from, from the right and from the left that emerged in Europe under capitalism? So border thinking is then what he suggests as a way to imagine possible futures. Now before I go on to my specific theoretical engagement with constitutionalism and a possible way to read this constitution, I want to jump to a recent court case. Um, and I, well, the, the event that prompted the case um, happened already in 2012, and I'm cautious when I recall this case, because I think as academics, we should be careful not to use the, the misery of others for our own academic purposes. So I, I'm telling the story with caution. But I do want us to think back of January 2012, when a five-year-old boy, Michael Kumape, started his first day at school. And we can imagine him walking with his mother, holding her hand to school. He was probably not wearing new shoes because he was coming from an impoverished community. So four days later, Michael Kumape fell and drowned when the structure of the pit toilet collapsed under him. And this is where his mother, after being called to the school, found him. And in the Supreme um, Court of Appeal case, they repeatedly refer to Michael Kumape's hand being in the air, waiting for someone to assist him. When his father came to the school, he was not allowed to remove the body of his dead son. It was only four hours later that the body of Michael Kumape was removed. Now, Section 27 is an NGO focusing on the right to e equal education, and, and they assisted the family. And the case was based on a number of claims. Firstly, emotional trauma. Secondly, grief. So interesting how they distinguished emotional trauma from grief. But then alternatively, also they asked for constitutional damages, funeral expenses, loss of earnings, and also medical costs. Now, in terms of the first claim, emotional trauma and grief, even though the state accepted liability, the, the court of quote did not award damages. Also in the second case, the court did not award damages. They did grant a structural interdict. Now, I'm not a scholar of delict, and my aim in, in invoking this case is not to go into the development of the common law as such, or even to reflect on constitutional damages. But really just to, I think, say that this, core, this case forces one to stand still and rethink and question the constitutional project. I think commentators agree that this boy lost his life in the most unimaginable horrific circumstances. And after his death, two other children died in the same way. How do we make sense of the, first, the court in first instance decision? And also of the way in which the state has resisted the claim. In the Supreme Court of Appeal, the, the judge repeatedly said that if ever a case had to be settled, it had to be this one. But the case, the state insisted taking this case further, and really prolonged also the trauma and the grief of, of this family. So in, in, interestingly here then is, is the, the claim for grief, and that the common law does not allow a claim for grief. So one of the arguments was that the court had to develop the common law to allow also grief. 
And, and I think an interesting question here is the distinction made by council between trauma and grief. And I think more work can be done about this. What is the difference? So maybe grief amounts to a loss that can never be recovered. After grief comes a certain mourning that will endure. With trauma, there's a potential for restoration through therapy and other means. But I think what this case also underscores is the issue of public grief and public responsibility. Now, the SCA awarded damages in December to the family. They did not distinguish between um, trauma and shock and grief. They collapsed the two. And therefore, they said it was not necessary to, co to develop the common law in light of the Constitution because they awarded um, damages. But I, I think the case underscores, um, as I said, this issue of public grief and public responsibility and the role then of a constitution, a living constitution, to really better the lives of all. In a recent talk um, at my university, Chief Justice Mokhwing was there, um, and he spoke about transformative constitutionalism and the potential of this project. And at some stage, he turned to the students, to all of us, and he said, you are the government. So my question is, if we are the government, if we as the people are held by the aspirations and commitments in the Constitution, what are we the people doing? How are we taking responsibility for and mourning the tragic death of this five-year-old boy? So let me turn to a more theoretical argument on the living constitution and specifically the idea of augmentation. So I'm relying here on um, a, a reading by Bonnie Hornig, which is a political theorist on, I just want to check my time. You'll, you'll shout if, I, if my time is up. I'm sorry, checking time. Okay. Um, so she's, she's looking at two reflections on the American Declaration of Independence, the, that by Hannah Arendt and then that by uh, the reading of Jacques Derrida. And I think these two readings and also Honig's attempt to bridge an impasse between the two of them opens up an interesting um, in, uh, aspect to be considered concerning constitutionalism, but also our debates in South Africa. So maybe <laughs> importantly to understand um, for Ardent, in her political thought, the problem of politics in modernity, the problem of founding a republic is, is, is central. And a concern really, how to establish lasting foundations without appealing to gods or appealing to a foundationalist ground or an absolute. And Ardent wonders, could it be possible to have a kind of a politics of foundation in a world where there are none of the traditional features? If you, if you Take back, you remember your shift from pre-modern to, to modern's understanding of state, politics, government, law. And importantly for art and politics and human action and therefore also constitutional making can never resist on an absolute. And for, because for art and an absolute is a truth that needs no agreement. Since, because of its self-evidence, it compels without argumentative demonstration or political persuasion. So that's an absolute, and for Arendt, there's no room for these kinds of things in politics, in action, in constitutional making. Because of this non-deliberative nature, it is anti-political. And Arendt's reading of the Declaration of Independence is that it is exactly one that does not rely on absolutes. Of course, what does she do with Jefferson's words that reads, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Isn't self-evidence exactly against what she's talking about? But Arendt says, Jefferson could have said, these truths are self-evident, but he didn't. He chose a different formulation. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And what does that mean for Arendt? That there was a moment of coming together 
where people deliberated and agreed that these truths are self-evident. So she still says these aren't based on an absolute. It's a product of a certain active deliberate, deliberative process. But, and, 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 and of course there are more technical things in this reading, what does Arden do with forgiving and promising and, and so on, that I'm not gonna go into detail. But the main point here is that for Arden, there should not be an external uh, moment or that, that could rely on an absolute. So Jacques Derrida, on the other hand, is more agreeable that in the Declaration of Independence and probably in any constitution, we'll have both of these. So we'll have absolutes. Derrida says there's no feature of language that is without this kind of absolute. But of course, they are also the open, the open moments. So when it refers very specific to performatives and constatives, but there are many who, who argues that in terms of speech act theory, she's not correct. So I'm less interested in whether in terms of speech act theory, she's correct or not. I, I only look at uh, to the extent that she reads Arendt's version as one of the Declaration of Independence that does not rest on any absolutes vis-a-vis -vis Derrida that says we have both moments. We have absolutes, but we also have the, these open moments. So how does it work? Because we, we, we said that for Arendt, this we hold is a source of authority. And it can be one of authority because it does not rely on an absolute because this hold is a sign that there was a prior pure political act where there was an agreement. But question then is, if this is a new beginning, how can there be a we that exists prior to the declaration? How can the we stand as the guarantor of its own performance? How can it function as the sole source of stability for the republic? And this is where Derrida comes in by saying, the signature invents the signifier. Meaning, the signer does not have the authority to sign until he has signed. So there's a retroactive uh, move and, and Derrida refers to this as a fabulous retroactivity. So when Jefferson is signing, he does not have the power to sign. But the moment he has signed, he has given himself power by way of retroactive, uh, retroactivity. So Arendt criticizes the Americans for not being brave enough, for not continuing in this belief that they did not rely on an absolute. But Derrida says no. The Americans appealed to this absolute, not, be, not because they were not brave, but because they did not overestimate their own power. They realized that they needed another subjectivity and that they can only be counter signatures. Founding, promising, signing cannot occur out of nothing. So Derrida says, for this declaration to have a meaning and effect, there must be a last instance. All right. So we see the two positions here, and how do we bridge, can we bridge the two? And this is exactly what Honig is doing in her piece. But maybe also we can ask, what is the point of the difference between these two readings for constitutionalism, and particularly for us trying to think of a critical approach to constitutional jurisprudence. A different turn, the difference turns on the possibility for politics and the capacity of a constitution, or maybe the constitution, to make politics possible. If it's based solely on an absolute, or absolutes, for Ardent it closes down all possibilities for political action. So she needs to ignore the absolute moments in the declaration. Derrida, on the other hand, concedes that we have both open-ended moments and absolutes in any kind of document. This is not only true for the Declaration, but in all systems, linguistic, cultural, political. And our interest is to see 
if it isn't maybe exactly in this tension, the tension between the absolute and the openness, that we can find a possibility for politics. So one sees these moments exactly as moments that should be treated as an invitation for intervention. She urges us not to deny those absolute moments, but rather to see them as opportunities for intervention and specifically for resistibility. And then she sees how this notion of resistibility lies at the center of Arden's new conception of authority for modernity. An absolute, in other words, a God, notion of God or self-evident truth or natural law even, is illicit because it is irresistible. It does not persuade to agreement. It is anti-political. Derrida also supports resistibility. And I'm quoting, he refuses to allow the law of la laws to be put unproblematically above man. Sick, we should add here. But he recognizes more deeply than Arden does that the law will always resist this resistance. And, and we know that. The law will resist this resistance. So. But she explains, Honig explains that Arden's theory of authority draw on the connection in Roman thought between the concept of authority and a practice of augmentation. The crucial point here is that republics do not rest on one world-building act of foundation, but are manifestly committed to augmentation, to the continual preservation and amendment of their foundation. So I'm quoting um, Machiavelli somewhere in this piece. They refer to um, the idea that we always begin again. We always start from fresh. So within current debates and views, I think this reading and a possible reconciliation between the views could be encouraging. What is crucial is the centrality of resistibility in both accounts that keeps possibilities for politics and with it then world making open. For Arden, the commitment to augmentation maintains the republic and its revolutionary spirit, keeping the beginning always present. Derrida and his work would refer to this as survivance, a kind of preservation through augmentation. Survival is not produced by the maintenance of a present into a future in a way that the fixed moment seeks to preserve the presence of what is past. Maintenance, then, is an augmentation that takes place by way of translation. The Constitution thus calls out to be amended. Text, all texts calls out to be translated. But this is not a translation in an ordinary sense. Translation augments, necessarily, that Derrida tells us. It does not merely copy or reproduce. It is a new linguistic event. It produces new textual bodies. It does not simply preserve an original in a practice of mere repetition. It dislodges the absolute yearnings of the original and finds the point of departure for a new way of life. So the crux for Arendt and then also Machiavelli is a beginning which is too firmly rooted in the past, will become reified, will become foundational. And what we see here then is a call for de-reification, for augmentation and amendment that makes beginning our own construction and performative. Honig also invokes Leo Strauss who says, foundation is, as it were, continuous foundation. So what could this mean for our present discourse on the Constitution? I think the possibilities are manifold and my aim here is not to unpack them fully but at the very least, it troubles any reading of the Constitution that regards it as grounded only in absolutes and that regards its historical moment or beginning as one that is fixed. It places translation and amendment at the heart of it. So the founding moments of South African constitutionalism, South African democracy, could then be seen as being open for translation, for um, augmentation and in this process resistibility but also undecidability can be um, underscored. So 
maybe we can refer here or bring this back to the idea of the Constitution as a living document. Um, and this is through an Amman in an early case, um, uh, Quisileni versus Minister of Law and Order, who calls, quoting, for the Rubicon to be crossed not only intellectually, but also emotionally, before the interpretation and application of the present Constitution is fully to come into its own right. He argues then for the Constitution to become a living document. So can the Constitution as a living document maybe be seen as something to be augmented continu continuously, but also as something to be translated? So, and this is mere, uh, as, as mere interpretation, in the sense of not being present yet. So I'm evoking the possibility that the Constitution as such is nothing and it's being constantly invented by every act of interpretation. So in the same way, maybe that at least the full stories of both Nelson and, and Willie Mandela haven't been told yet and will never be told finally. For me, it is in this notion of a continuance that we can also find a critical, a critical jurisprudence. Augmentation captures the idea that beginning is always present in other words, we are not confronted with fixed or reified notions of authority contained in an absolute. Um, so maybe then important here is also the maintenance or the preservation of care for and sharing of a world, I think is what is at stake when we think about the critical jurisprudence. Hannah Arendt famously denounced Adolf, Adolf Eichmann for his refusal to share the world with others. Judith Butler has taken up this notion in her writings also on Palestine. Stuart Motha, in a recent work, articulates the question of belonging as central to post-colonial, but also post-apartheid being. Um, and he actually asks the questions, how do we become belongers? How do belonging and cohabitants relate to notions of founding, augmentation, and translation? These are questions that could be part of a critical approach to law and um, jurisprudence. So maybe just to end, in academic discourse we engage critically, we theorize from different angles, showing the ways in which the Constitution either lives up or up to or fails to live up to the issue of redress, transformation, many other things. So in a way, a tragic event like the death of this boy that I refer to, make us realize the limit of theory, no matter where it comes from, and in a way, thoughts or descriptions of the Constitution as a tool to transform. That is one response, and I'll, I'll refer to a quote from Kentridge in a, in, a, in a minute that refers to this as paralysis. But there's maybe also another approach. By insisting on the work that must happen in this country to uplift each and every one in our society, to insist on the Constitution as a living document open to continuous augmentation containing resistibility. So maybe two more remarks. One really on the university and particularly law faculties and legal education. I believe it is our task to prepare our students so that they can take on and take up together with every other person living in this country the demand to bring about a radical change to the lives of all. But the other one maybe is just to bring, come back to complexity. The late Paul Sohier was a complex theory scholar remarked that if we acknowledge that the world in which we have to live is complex, we also have to acknowledge the limitations of our understanding of the world. He argued for, oh, oh that's my timer, sorry. <laughs> um, he argued for modesty saying that the term modest refers to reflective positions that are careful about the reach of the claims being made and of the constraints that make these claims possible. And I invoke these because I think we should approach the issue of the constitution, constitutionalism also as a complex one, one with no easy answers. So here reminded us, if meaning is relational, not representational, there are potentially an infinite amount of relations at stake each time the meaning of something is generated. These relations should be heeded in each and every view or comment we make. The other line, maybe, is to revisit and question the issue of Western modernity in a way that's where the Kentridge 
uh, pictures will come in. I should actually just start going to them. Um, I wonder if... Uh, okay. Um, so maybe I just... I, I, um, we can... Re uh, I, I'm constantly re-inspired by Michel Foucault's engagement with Immanuel Kant's piece on enlightenment. And really interesting that this piece by Kant on enlightenment appeared in a newspaper. Um, we can imagine, if we read what's going on in newspapers these days, that this kind of thing will, will actually be published in a newspaper. But in Kant then, what is enlightenment? Enlightenment is the moment when humanity is going to put its own reason to use without subjecting itself to authority. The, precisely at this moment, critique is necessary, since its role is that of defining the conditions under which the use of reason is legitimate in order to determine what can be known, what must be done, and what may be hoped. So reflecting on enlightenment and modernity, because I wonder whether we may not envisage modernity rather as an attitude than as a period of history. And by attitude, I mean a mode of relating to contemporary reality, a way of thinking and feeling too, a way too of acting and behaving that at one and the same time marks a relation of belonging and presents itself as a ta task. So I think it's this attitude that we can sort of value when we um, think about um, and, and insist, when we insist on the Constitution as a living document. Because it marks a relation of belonging, but at the same time, it also demands certain, certain things to be done. Um, so maybe just the slides from Kentridge, and, and if you haven't been to his latest exhibition, um, I think it ends on the 30th of March, so, so I think really important for all South Africans, for all of us, to, to get there. But maybe just Kentridge, because I see an important shift also in, in Kentridge. Um, many years ago, I, I quoted him on indeterminacy, where he said, I believe that in the indeterminacy of drawing, and openness for traces and for other ways of remembering, imagining, and justifying could come to the fore. A way in which justice, although it can never be done or seen to be done, um, no, sorry, no, I'm, I'm skipped. Let me read this again. I believe that in the indeterminacy of drawing, the contingent way that images arrive in the work lies some kind of model of how we live our lives. The activity of drawing is a way of trying to understand who we are and how we operate in the world. It is in the strangeness of the activity itself that can be detected judgment, ethics, and morality. Trains of thought that seem to be going somewhere but can't quite be brought to a conclusion. If there were to be a very clear ethical or moral summing up in my work, it would have a false authority. So this is Kentridge on his drawings. But maybe, and we see, if we know his art, his, his, his techniques of, of, of drawing, erasure, uh, etc. But maybe, more recently, Kentridge also says, I'm interested in the traces of what prompts a reconstruction, not just the trace as such, or the, in, or the unreconstructed state. He asks, what prods an imaginative leap? But in the end, he says, I'm making a drawing. The interest for me is not just the foundation from all the different possibilities that could come of it. I'm interested in, in arriving at one, even if it's an incorrect one. So it's not a matter of just saying, here's a phrase, which is unclear. It's the leap into it, which is a leap out of indeterminacy, in a way. So the indeterminacy is there at the base, but for me, the interest lies in the movement in a drawing. Indeterminacy suggests paralysis if you stay there. Then just two more. Kentridge says, I discovered years ago that I would always defer to people who, feel, who felt certain. And it took me a long time to realize that in fact, in many cases, in retrospect, I'd prefer my uncertain impulses to the certainty. 
which was pre presented. And then on provisionality says the certainty of knowledge being only a single moment of coherence among a sea of possible other senses and meanings. Precarious victories, uh, we thought solid and established. Victories like civil rights, victories like democracy. There's also the enormous danger that they disintegrate back into the fire, into the ash, into, into the smoke. Um, and, and this is really, I think, a current project trying to think through Kentridge, um, the possibilities of a jurisprudence of doubt, and again, um, I think invoking uh, why do I say that? Thank you. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm uh, Gary Richards. I was asked to moderate um, this talk on the basis, uh, so Christy said, because <coughs> because I lecture in the in this discipline. Well, I thought I lectured in this discipline. I don't know what I'm actually doing, to be honest with you, <laughs> because um, uh, Frith von Mahler is sort of quietly intimidating, isn't she? You sit there, sort of overwhelmed um, by this intellectuality. You just don't quite know. All right, sorry. Tell me, as a matter of interest, the, your alarm there, was that summertime? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yes, it was. The irony, of course, <laughs> is the next line is, and the living is easy. <laughs> it's somewhat ironic, given the, the, the particular topic. So the, the question for, the, well, the issue for me is to take questions from the floor, if there, if there are any. Um, yes. notes to get the discussion going. So Karen, you know, uh, thank you so much, and you know, um, I'm a leader of your work. Um, and, I, and I thought, uh, I mean, as you know, that John Duco word, you know, the, the art of buying books and never reading them, you know, which is a particular, uh, you know, pension for, for academics as well. But I, I had, you know, I think I, I fall. Uh, you know, victim to that uh, psychological condition. But I picked up a book that I bought many years ago, uh, maybe five or so, from Derek book on post-apartheid conditions. You know, and I was wondering in your thesis whether the idea of the psychic, the material, and the social around the idea of constitutionist uh, feature in those ways. But I also like your injunction around. This is one. I also like your, your injunction around the, the idea of the interplay between absolutes and, and... For the video. Oh, okay. The idea between, between absolutes and openness uh, and, the, and the kind of arguments both from Derrida and Arendt and of course Honig's uh, idea of trying to reconcile them. And then I, I thought, uh, you know, just to to double check whether, whether the idea of your good friend Seppo's uh, post-conquest constitutionist, constitutionist, uh, whether that uh, is, is not a way of um, probably thinking that that particular interplay between absolutes and, and openness is an impossibility that I'm also work, that there needs to be a different set of logics coming into play outside of what uh, Bonnie Honig tried to do with Arendt and, and, and Derrida's work. And then just to say, as a, just by the way, because you may find it interesting, I, I have a fine art student, a doctoral student, who regards the work of William Kentridge, actually, and the form of the gazes on certain kinds of bodies as recentering whiteness as well, and I, and of course, uh, that, that's uh, emerging work, and, uh, but I find the proposition uh, fascinating given uh, the high regard within which we hold uh, William Kentridge's work as a, as a post-apartheid uh, you know, observer through his work on our social condition. Uh, and of course, uh, it's nothing to say about how you use them. I find that uh, great. Thank you so much. Thank 
you. Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah, let me start with a comment on Cambridge. I mean, that's that's a, a I mean, it's interesting, and I think um, I'm aware of some of the critiques on Cambridge. Uh, Kendry, to the extent to which he's also sometimes criticized as a nostalgic, because you see in many of his words were the old telephone reappearing and the the, the camera and, 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 and so on. Um, and 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 he's, he, I mean he's a Kendridge, so he comes from a very specific specific family from, from privilege. And I don't think he but I don't think he ever denied that. So in a way I think he I wonder, I wonder if he will deny that, even that accusation on his guys. Oh, that, let me not talk for for Kendrick, but I think, I mean, I think it's a it's a useful in, in, in engagement on on Kendrick. Um, Why well, I'm also just I suppose it, particularly intrigued in Kendrick is because he comes from this family of lawyers, and and when he writes about his own engagement with law and how he really wanted to move away from from that sort of fixed rigid. In position, even even though he comes from a family of struggle lawyers, but but still, um, so maybe so Tsepo's work. I mean, I think it's 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 very interesting and very valuable work. Um, the only uh, the only concern I'll, I'll have is I. I mean, I think obviously, art and Derrida, Hornig. That's only one sort of genre of engagements and Tsepo's work and, and many other sort of the work doing being done by South African scholars, black scholars on the constitution is very important. Um, and if 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 if, if Tsepo was here I could have asked him, I I th I just think that even a post conquest constitution will will have limits and will have similar failures. So so in a way I think I I come from a critical position that I'm not only criticizing this constitution because of certain things that went wrong in the mid-90s, but I think in law as such, in all constitutions, there'll be limits. So I think a post-conquest constitution might be better than the, our, our present one, but I think even that one will have to be open for constant augmentation and change. Um, yes, I'm, I know that book by Derek Hook, um, and I've I've heard him speak. So, so just to say, I think the the relation between the psychic, the social, and the and the material is really important. And I think what Hook is doing also by reading Biko and Fanon, um, I'm I think I'm probably just I I never feel comfortable talking about Freud and, and Lacan. And I think Hook is much better <laughs> in 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 doing that. Um, so I don't think I. Work, maybe work enough with the, with the notion of the psychic and 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 thanks for reminding me about that book. Definitely something that I should turn to again. Thanks. Yes, Avanish. Corin, thanks very much. I think we all, um, like Andre, perhaps feel we need to do some more reading and probably less administration. Um, but perhaps let me let me just ask whether the notion of the constitution as a living instrument hasn't itself already been built into the constitution. The rejection of the basic structure doctrine, um, a departure from, for example, the Indian approach to constitutionalism, and then your your point, I think, quoting Mahueng, in respect of how we are in fact the government and whether the failure to in fact engage with the constitution as a living instrument through the relative lack of substantive amendments, how long it takes to amend sections, no changes to section one. But I mean, I think that the point I want to make is that, I can't remember the section now, but there's <laughs> certainly an argument, and I think quite a uh, uncontroversial one, that all of the constitution can be amended, can be changed with the right majorities and that to me is an expression of the constitution as a living document and I think to um, perhaps put the focus on the constitution and its structure as being almost part of the part of the challenge of course it is in terms of the process it creates but perhaps it undermines the agency in terms of 
the actors, the, the people themselves uh, who put people into power, who then have the power themselves to, to change the constitution. And perhaps you want to reflect on, on that tension. Thanks. Um, I just, I just wanted to, is this working? Just, just to add to that is, 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 and, and it was going to be the same point. And, and is, is, I, I don't actually know why, why we resist the idea of the constitution being a living document and the constitution being one that can change. All law develops all the time. So, so, so why would we have this inherent, or apparently lawyers would have this apparent hesitation about the constitution developing? What, what is so wrong with that? You know, you go to all talks about, oh, the Constitution is, and therefore we shall be. I mean, that's, that's nonsense as far as I'm concerned. So, just coming in at a gut feel level. So, I mean, I, I, I think you're, you're right that the this Constitution as a, as a structure um, enables this possibility of a living document. That's also, I mean, the Frunemann case is an early case where he already g gives us this description. So, so maybe in a way, when I, when I talk about the living constitution, I, I, I'm talking about how we apply and interpret and what we, what we make of it. Um, so, so, so I think also when I started working on this paper, these debates about the property clause, or, I mean, now it's always passe. Um, but exactly, we had many, uh, and not only lawyers, but people saying it should not change. So, so why is this? legal culture, very specific conservative formalist legal culture, but also I think sometimes even people outside law is more, uh, are more formalist than within law because people want law to give certainty. Um, so quite often I, you know, people don't like listening to me because they don't want to hear lawyers talking about indeterminacy and contingency and, 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 and openness. So, so yes, I mean, the notion of the living constitution in that sense is not new, but I think we're not living it. Um, so in a way, a constitution, for me, I've, I've sometimes just said to, to students, to people on difficult debates, the constitution in a way is nothing. Constitution is just a piece of paper. It depends on what we do with it, the, 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 the content that we give every time we enact it. So, so, um, so last time I taught legal interpretation for the very first time, and and, and this whole notion of concretization just you know, opened up. Even legislation, it only comes to life in that moment of concretization. Before that, there's almost nothing. So, so, so again, so bringing it into, I suppose, habitat, um, inhabitants, so the fact that there is a constitution, a structure. Um, I'm not saying you know, that, that we can't have some constitutions can't be better than others, but, but it's really about how we interpret, how we talk about the constitution. Because I think in these debates, and not only those who think the constitution is fantastic and should not be um, changed, but also the argument of, of those saying the constitution is the cause for the continuance of poverty, the continuance of racism, and so on. And I also, I think, want to say to them, no, it's not. It, it can be, of course. Constitution can be interpreted in a very problematic way, confirming only the status quo and, and, and preventing all possibilities. But at the same time, it, I don't think it, 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 it has to be like that. And, 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 and I think that's the, you know, the push. So, so we need, that's why I think legal education, what we do in law schools, what do we teach our, our, our students, but maybe also the public in a way, to, 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 to um, it should not be controversial. To, to amend the constitution, because the constitution. I do think what I'm trying to say through the authors here, um, augmentation, this kind of trans translation, is also more than mere amendment. Okay, because I think mere amendment, if we look at this in the guise of legal reform, is the religious really change um, in the way of evolution. So Drusalakul now makes this distinction between evolution and transformation. And law, legal reform and maybe amendment, a certain kind of amendment, will only play out in sort of the vein of evolution, where I think what we need is maybe a more radical transformation that will also speak to transformation of systems as such and also the transformation of the individuals or the subjects within, within the system, which, which I think could be more than amendment.
Thanks. Thanks, Corin, very much for, for the work. Um, I mean, your input has, has provoked a number of thoughts, May I want to try and bring them together. I mean, the first is your reference, I suppose, to the abolitionist position around this idea that the f that almost a founding limitation, if you like, of the Constitution is its inability to radically restructure a set of power relations, at least the operations and exercise of power, which you ha haven't spoken a lot, a lot about. Um, um, and then, in a sense, you're making a call, I think, or hinting to the Orange call around this deliberative imperative, which is then about claiming a non-absolute um, reading. And one might, in fact, argue that, in, uh, you know, uh, kind of the, the denial of the Constitution or the desire to see the problem as the Constitution in itself is absolute, takes on an absolutist form. So if one thinks about that, th those dimensions, and then draws in your reference to grievability. Um, my question is about what is this bringing together, putting the political into the into the the realm of constitutional power. What does it mean for grievability? And if we see the necessity of constituting a we in order to grieve, in, in other words, to make such grievability possible. On what basis do we do that constituting of we that is not indeed absolutist or ha that ha doesn't have a kind of a foundational absolutist dimension to it? Thanks, Medini. Um, uh, I think an important uh, question, difficult question. Let me try and, and respond, but I'll definitely continue thinking also. Um, so maybe just the we, I think, is also a we that we will have to constantly reconstruct. There's not, there's not a we, all right? Um, so who the, who the we might be maybe depends. And, and again, I think this notion of a retroactive working would be useful. Um, but yeah, gri grievability. Um, and I think bringing grievability to the Constitution. So, so, lo so w lots of work has been done um, in making this distinction that was originally made by um, Johan Sneijman, who was a philosopher, and then Lawrence de Plessis followed on, and, and many of us followed this initial distinction between the Constitution as monument and the Constitution as memorial. And, and the Constitution as monument, I think now, almost would be in, in, in these, this discourse, the Constitution is this absolute document, where the memorial Constitution was always the Constitution that recognizes its own limits, its own failures, um, but also um, things like historical conscious self-consciousness being so central to understanding the Constitution as, as, as mourning. Um, and as mem memorial, so so what 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 what, is, what can this mean? What does this mean? And and, and I think then from from mourning we can get to to grievability, um, and the difficulties and this is what we'll have from Butler is that some lives are not deemed to be grievable, and the extent to which I think many people will feel that the Constitution is continuing this is again deeming some lives not not grievable so so how to how to bring how to bring this in um, so I, I I have a doctoral student at the moment working on um, the group areas act and the extent to which even though the group areas act has been demolished um, we see the continuance of a certain apartheid spatial geography and she's looking at grievability looking at uh, specific cases where uh, women, women are women are raped or sexually violated, and what happens, um, and and the response by the police and so on, and, and and really how it depends on on your race, and and so again we see this continuance of of grievability. So our project is to to work also with the Fave's notion of the right to the city, and she's asking, can the right to the city also include the right to grieve, the right to mourn. Um, but I think your question is, can the Constitution grieve um, and, and, and mourn? And I think that is work to be continued. I think, I think those early writings on understanding the Constitution in a memorial fashion opened up 
the way. But I was, I was thinking of this as I was sort of preparing that the next step here will have to be to think of the constitution and, and how the constitution allows grievability. But, but almost, if we talk about the living constitution, can we talk about the constitution that grieves? Yes. yes. So, could we have that microphone? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I just have two questions. The first is drafting a constitution in pursuit of dignity, even though that provision might be going against the majority, citing the equality clause in South Africa, whereas you had um, organizations like the uh, uh, Christian parties, they were saying, like, no, uh, from the interim constitution, remove that clause, because the majority of South Africans might not um, I agree in terms of uh, the the same sex, uh, the protection of um, same sex relations, sexual orientation. But now the idea of trying to give dignity to each and every inhabitant of South Africa, now against what the majority may want to um, to detain. And then again, with that inclusion, does that not speak in terms of a backdoor approach in terms of getting rights? Because with that adoption of the equality clause or the retention of the equality clause from the interim constitution, then we'd opened um, availability to try and get rights in terms of um, marriage equality and then maybe rights again in terms of how to easily change one's birth, birth marker in terms, of the, in terms of home affairs. So just the issue of being uh, pursuing constitution in pursuit of dignity even though it might be against the majority, and how does that um, come up with a strategy in terms of getting a backdoor approach to people's rights? Um, all right, so I, I assume what you mean with a backdoor approach is uh, a kind of insistence on, on formal equality that will prevent radical transformation that will prevent programs like employment equity and so on. I, is that what you, I assume that's what you, is that your fear that a certain reading, no? Sorry. Because um, my interest in terms of the equality clause in the constitution, the, the sexual, sexual orientation equality clause in the constitution, and retaining that from the interim one in terms of the, the one that we have now, allowed for court actions that allowed for people to pursue same-sex um, uh, same sex unions. Yeah. So by retaining that clause in the, from the initial one, it allowed for, for people to go back to the courts to want um, same-sex marriage or be able to adopt a child as a same-sex couple and being able to maybe to change your birthmark if you say that we're all equal. So in terms of having adopted that e equality clause in terms of sexual orientation that we may not be discriminated against in terms of sexual orientation, that went against one. It provided everyone with dignity, which they deserve. But now in terms of that strategy that was used in terms of lessons of muffling what the majority would have allowed when we are granted, if it was to go to a referendum, I doubt it would have been included. So that kind of strategies of putting it there, firmly there, but even though it might be against what the majority would have voted against at a referendum, and then bringing away for people to claim further rights, but in terms of further court actions litigation, which is why I said it was a great way, but even though it wasn't a front up providing rights, but it allowed for a backdoor approach for people to go and uh, go to the courts as avenues of relief. Okay, thank you. Now, now I understand what, what you're saying. Um, so we, we, um, I would say luckily, we live in a constitutional state, and that means it's not a state where we vote on things like that by way of referendum. So when we've adopted constitutional supremacy with certain foundational values, we all agreed that these will be the guiding values of, your, of our society. So I would not say that it, that, that it has given a backdoor approach. It has given a right to same-sex couples to pursue the right to marriage um, in an open way, not in, an, uh, not in a backdoor way. So if your concern is that the dignity of some 
will be infringed because others now also enjoy dignity and equality. I mean, that is what we deal with in a constitutional st state. So, so, so we, we work with a balancing of rights. Our right, all rights should be interpreted and applied and implemented in a very specific re relational way. But, and, and as you've mentioned, our founding values are dignity, equality, democracy, um, and I would add transparency, and, and, and many scholars would say Ubuntu as a found, foundational value. So maybe by linking dignity with Ubuntu, we take it away from a pure Western Kantian understanding of dignity, and we already place at the heart of dignity also um, the interests of a, of, a, of a broader community. But by, by saying that, I maybe just to, to repeat, I think the idea of voting or, or play, putting certain things up for a referendum will go against the constitutional state. The constitutional state, constitutional supremacy is there exactly to protect, uh, if you want, the rights of those who, who others might not want to respect and, and protect. Right, uh, left the back there. Sorry. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Prof, and everyone. Uh, I, I don't know. I always hold a view that South African constitutionalism, as a whole, is built on a. I agree with a, a colleague. Uh, Dr. Joel Madira, I know he's a, an abortionist. What is it? Abortionist? Yeah, that word. But in any case, it's built on th on three uh, foundations. So it is informed by the model of constitutionalism in England, the United States, and Germany. So I don't get to see anything about African constitutionalism and contribution to the constitutionalism here in South Africa. So my question is just how representative and how inclusive uh, is the South African constitution based on the sense of belonging to which you referred to earlier? Because if I can put it into perspective, if you look at now the land issue, for example, which is the, 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 the topical issue currently, they don't know what to do with the issue of the Ngonyama Trust in KwaZulu-Natal. So if you can have something like a customary court of appeal which has a final say on all customary law matters. And I have a problem even with the use of the word customary law because in my opinion, I'd like to call it indigenous law. I believe customary law is just watered down indig indigenous law. So how, just how can we make the South African constitution more inclusive to accommodate the majority in, in, in as far as the values and systems are concerned? Thank you. Um, so, definitely, we see the traces, or more than traces, of Western, or if you want, Northern influences in our in our constitution. Um, maybe less UK, but definitely North America, Canada, and and also um, Germany. At the same time, I and I know um, and I know Joel while well, he was my student uh, will disagree. But I think when Carl Clare refers to our constitution as a post-liberal constitution, I get what he's trying to say here, because he's not saying it's an African constitution. Or in his article, he, he thinks he says he wondered whether he should refer to this as a social democratic constitution. But at the end, he, he chose to refer to it as a post-liberal constitution holding on and being honest about the liberal elements, the, the Western Northern elements in the Constitution, but at the same time also allowing for a shift. And, and what is that shift? And I, I don't think it's insignificant. So certain things, the direct inclusion of socioeconomic rights, the fact that our Constitution does not only protect the vertical relationship, but also protects horizontality. The openness, the, the, the possibility for a multicultural 
experience that our constitution allows, the historical self-consciousness in the constitution, that if we take it seriously, every time we interpret the constitution and each act that we interpret in light of the constitution, we should recall the past, which could a be a colonial past, an apartheid past. So, so in a way, your question maybe also links with what uh, Professor Kiet asked about um, a post-conquest co constitution. So if we rewrite the constitution and we make it now an African constitution, and I'm not saying we can't do it or amend it in such a way that it ends up possibly being closer to an African constitution, I still believe there will be flaws because the constitution will be a, 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 a structure of language that I think again will limit or, or, or exclude and will again call out for change and, and augmentation. Um, so you, you're right that if we take the founding moment as a fixed one, then most definitely our constitution is a Western constitution and it is deeply flawed. But I think what I'm trying to say, and it's not, I'm not only trying to use this as some kind of strategic intellectual tool, but if we understand the constitution as something that is really open for continuous change and and augmentation in a more radical form than mere amendment, I think there's a possibility to make this constitution also more African, to imbue it with more African values, African philosophies, African epistemologies every time we apply it, we interpret it, we create it. So, so again, if we refer to this constitution as a living constitution, the constitution as such is nothing. The Constitution becomes alive when we apply it, when we interpret it when, it, when it is concretized. And then I think it is very important that um, African, no, African law, I, I think someone like Tsepo would prefer African law, not even indigenous law, that African law should, should become part. Um, I think that is behind the Constitution initially, that it gives equal status to common law and to African law. It's not, it's not happening, but again, I don't know if it's in the heart of the Constitution where the problem lies. It lies with the development and, and so on. Um, maybe just to say that at the same time, I, 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 I believe in a Constitution that would protect rights against homophobia, rights against racism, rights against patriarchy. So, 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 um, and, and I think where, and I don't think African law necessarily uh, is patriarchal or is homophobic in the same way as Western law is not necessarily not homophobic. But I think if as a society we decide on certain values, so that's, that's back to Jefferson's we, we hold, and if those values are equality, dignity, freedom, democracy, transparency. Those values should also guide us when we bring in aspects of African law into the Constitution. And it's not, only, it's not about bringing in aspects, it's about making it central to the Constitution as a living Constitution for, for all of us living in South Africa. Is there anyone else? Yes. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. Um, the uh, when we're talking, when you're talking about the constitution as a living document, uh, is it only in the sense of of court interpretation and court's application of of the constitution, uh, or can one also read it then as becoming alive, becoming this uh, this living document that you're talking about? when it is actually utilized by those people, those groups of people, those categories of people who were previously excluded, who are now included on the basis of the Constitution, who are basically now seen as part of our society and, 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 and entitled to equal humanization, when those people actually use the Constitution to expand their rights, not only in the courts, so not only through litigation and so on, but actually as a basis of politics and, and expanding. If, if uh, you know, I'm thinking of... of um, Various, uh, just at the moment, if you think about the prominence of gender-based violence, uh, which has been placed centrally, 
And the, the reason why feminist activists can do that is, is partly because this right, um, uh, women's, women's rights as, as equal human beings are actually entrenched in the constitution. So that's been the basis of a massive politics, uh, a campaign of, of politics that's, that's then been targeted at the state to try and get the state to move and and for me that that is what what makes the constitution a, a living document where where certain where, where certain people who were previously excluded we were previously um, uh, sort of and de dehumanized etc cetera, etc cetera, use it actually as a basis of of political action to try and impact the state and then just from there the the abolitionist position to me seems to be confusing the constitution with with politics or the constitution with the state, because in in a sense that that the the uh, the constitution ultimately, as you say, becomes alive when we use it to agitate, when we actually construct our um, uh, yeah we, we try and construct more liberatory subjectivities on on the basis of it. That, but the it, it's it's uh, it, to put it crudely, the you know this argument that because everything in the constitution hasn't been achieved. It means it's uh, it's a failure. Therefore, it should be uh, rejected out of hand. While in in fact, what you've what you've had in South Africa is a failure of politics. You've had a failure of the state, and so there's a kind of a misattribution that's happening, uh, which I think it's actually a strategic misattribution. But um, yeah, so those are just some of my thoughts. If you if you'd like to comment, thanks. Thanks. Um, so most definitely, I think what, what, what happens in courts is really a very small example. Um, and, I, I, and I take the critique that is quite often leveled to at least those who, who will follow sort of tenets of American US critical legal scholars, that they, they try to pay all their attention to courts. And, and that's, uh, that's a critique also levered against uh, Claire. So I'm not, and, I, and I, I think even Claire will, I'll say that I think we have very important things happening in courts, therefore we should not shy away from making also use of courts. Um, but that's only one of many other examples where um, the Constitution should you know, pl pl play a role. Um, so, so yes, I think social movements, the extent to which social, social movements um, can use the constitution. Um, I mean, I think, so there's obviously something in me that my limits, limits of the law, uh, sort of perspective or ontology will be, will be cautious. As many people say that the moment, um, you know, at some stage the social movement will um, obtain a lawyer and the moment the lawyer enters, um, the law takes over. And, and, and it can happen that the social movement then weakens. Um, but of course, as, 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 a, as a crit, I also believe that law is politic. So I, I think law, to say that there's the legal, sort of, sort of strict of legal process and here we have politics, that, that's just unrealistic. It's abstract, it doesn't work like that. Law, law is politics and in that sense, um, not politics maybe in a partisan way, of course. Um, so here, um, the work of Nancy or Le Colabart who would refer to the political is, is, is more relevant. So, so and that's where I think the linkage is, is between uh, law and law and politics. Um, so, so y yes, I mean, I, I will be more cautious, but of course, I think if more social movements, if more activists run with uh, the notion of a living constitution or the rights that, that, they, that, that were given in the constitution, I, I, absolutely. Um, although, I, you know, I, I will say why so many years after the constitution do we still have all this gender-based violence? So in that sense, I, I would have wanted the constitution to, if it's a living constitution, why why aren't we living it? So why the continuance? But okay, we, we can give the answers. Continuance of patriarchy, of homophobia, of, of, of whatever. Um, so yes, I mean, I think to, to blame the Constitution as the thing, 
And I'm not saying that the Constitution is perfect or constitutional court is always perfect, but to put up the Constitution as the thing, um, and I know I'm going to be slapped for this, but I, I think it's just lazy thinking. I want, I want better thinking. I think we are at a stage in our country we want more rigorous thinking. And, you know, it's, maybe this might be a problematic example, but there was a time where we, when I grew up, we only watched movies coming out of European countries because the belief was that all movies coming out of Hollywood was really bad. And at some stage, I think we realized that's lazy thinking because we also see good movies coming out of Hollywood. <laughs> so the point is, I think we, just because someone is making a constitutional argument or claiming a constitutional right does not mean that person is standing in the way of real or radical transformation. So, so, so it, I think we can rethink also the possibilities. And of course we need the theorists and the intellectuals problematizing the constitution and even calling for a different kind of constitution. I think that, that, that is what academia, what intellectual discourse, public discourse is, is about. I think my sense was this, that at some stage we only had these two positions. The one position be, being really optimistic about the possibilities for the Constitution, the other one saying the Constitution must go. And I think this is sort of my small attempt just to say, well, you know, let's, let's try and think also about the third or an in-between um, position. All right, is there, is there anyone else? Um, all right. I actually have a question, um, but I'm I'm going to restrain myself um, because I think that we've, we've um, spent quite a lot of time on this. I just want to uh, thank you. This is the most uh, informative, um, and uh, I, I suppose it in in a way um, highlights just the sort of liquidity that 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 law is or should be, perhaps. And maybe if if more of us thought that way, we'd have made some more progress. And I think that it also highlights, uh, I think, the this, this process, the, the, four, the four elements, and every element, of course, it seems uh, has a role to play in pushing us to think. And I think that that's, that's essentially what it's about. Um, it's my privilege to deliver a vote of thanks on behalf of everyone that's seated here and everyone who will be joining us via online platforms. Um, thank you to our speaker for the thought-provoking um, presentation. Uh, a special thank you to the organizing team um, from Canred, uh, Professor Van de Vestazen and Ms. Zandile, and then from the law faculty, um, Prof. Gavinji, Dr. Diggs, um, Prof. Botha, Mr. Richards, of course, uh, the Crichet team, our videographer, and of course, our caterers. Thank you.